Right. Well, thank you for uh, coming today. I am here to share with you a little bit about the work of the Minnesota Land Trust. And we are a statewide nonprofit organization that helps landowners protect and restore habitat uh, throughout the state. I'm going to start with a little bit about um, land trust in general. It's a land trust have been around for quite a while. It's a it's a process or a, a an idea that started uh, on the East Coast in the the, the late 1800s. Um, Minnesota came to the game a little bit later in the in the process. We started as an organization um, in the early um, early 1980s, 90s, early 1990s. Um, but we've had our, our history of environmental protection in Minnesota goes goes back a long a long way, and we're pretty fortunate here. I mean, we we love our outdoors, we love recreating outside, we love enjoying nature. In short, we're really living the the good life here, right? But we know there's a lot of uh, pressures and and things that that maybe aren't connect connecting us to 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 nature all of the time. And some of the things that we've done, some of the things that we are doing. Uh, are not helping all that much, including this is a raw sewage discharge into the St. Louis River uh, years ago. Um, um, even sometimes when we're trying, we might not be quite getting the hitting the hitting the target here. Well, a little more than 25 years ago in uh, Washington County, uh, east of the, the metro in the Twin Cities, a small group of, of people that were concerned about the future of Minnesota's natural places really decided to take action and they formed Washington County Land Trust. Um, with a very modest mission of, of protecting and restoring pretty much all of the good things in, in the state for all of the people for forever. Um, we started out fairly small with a, with a, a handful of conservation easements um, down, oops, I hit the wrong button, uh, a handful of easements down in the, in the metro area and a couple of other places, including one spot up on, up on the North Shore. But as we've gone through time, we really expanded our, our efforts to protect uh, uh, private land um, with the cooperation and, and partnership with the, with the landowner. So, um, as we kind of click through here, you'll see um, the the number of yellow dots represents the number of conservation easements, the places that we that we have conservation easements on the landscape. Um, bringing us um, pretty much to where we are today with conservation easements um, scattered across the state. Um, we've also some of the some of the red X's there represent places that we have habitat restoration projects going on as well. Um, almost uh, 80,000 acres of, of land and, and nearly um, 700 conservation easements. We have a three part strategy to work toward that mission. Um, protect, restore and engage. Um, that three-part mission really drives the kind of work that, that we do on a day-to-day on a -day basis. So restoration work includes things that, that really kicked off in the St. Louis River in and around Duluth, where we were helping the, the DNR in particular address more than a century of, of damage to this huge freshwater estuary in the St. Louis River, including places where we have sawmill waste that's been in the water for, for more than 100 years. Uh, removing that and restoring fish habitat and, and access for anglers um, on the river. Um, we've removed hardened shorelines. This is uh, Chambers Grove Park where it used to have a sheet pile uh, and, a, and a, basically a fence that prevented people from touching the river. And now we're, we've reconnected people to the river. We've changed the way that the, the river energy uh, flows in the center of the channel instead of running up against um, an eroding shoreline. And, and people can actually get to the river. Now there's a, a carry down boat access and, and um, rocks placed for fish habitat, but it allows people to get out onto the, onto the river and, and, um, and fish from that, that pier. Um, includes wild rice restoration, where we're working not only to uh, restore wild rice to that estuary for, for wildlife, but for cultural uh, harvest as well. 
our restoration project has has spread across the state and includes private land and, and some new partnerships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, and some of those partners to help people manage land for habitat values that they might not otherwise be able to do on their own. And here in the Lake Superior watershed, we're working with private landowners and, and other nonprofit partners to restore forest communities that are affected by things like spruce budworm and deer browse and climate change. Engagement is another key piece of, uh, of our strategy and it's, a, it's another really important, uh, somewhat more recent part of the way that we're going about doing our business. And it's really a recognition that we need people to care enough about the lands and the waters and the wildlife and those scenic values to be able to continue to protect them in the future. If we don't start building and help build those communities of people that care about it, um, all the protection that we're doing today is not going to be maintained into the future. And we're ensuring that our conservation leaders that we have, the conservation leaders of tomorrow have a path forward to, to learning and engaging with the natural world today. We know that things like overall participation in, in fishing and hunting is declining and things like adventure sports are increasing. And our work really recognizes that the recreation that, that we do, the work, recreation that our parents did, is not necessarily the recreation that our kids are going to be engaged in. So we're working strategically with units of government and, and user groups to grow outdoor recreation efforts. As part of this effort, we, um, we worked with the city of Duluth to develop um, and to designate a, a new city park in the city of Duluth, uh, Quarry Park. Uh, really, really popular for climbing, ice climbing and mixed climbing, but it's also a place where uh, a new place that residents can can come and and picnic and do disc golf and to to just spend time outside in a place that that historically was not mm -hmm. available or accessible to them. We're also working with camps and nature centers ac across the state. Um, in recognition that these places are not only places that have really significant and sometimes large tracts of, of high quality uh, natural land, but these are the places that, that help connect people with the outdoors and the natural world. And sometimes it's the, the first time that some of the uh, campers have ever really connected with the natural world. Um, the work that we've done the longest and the, um, the work that I particularly um, spend most of my time work, working on is, is the protection part of our strategy. Uh, mostly what I do is focusing on helping landowners, private landowners protect habitat using conservation easements as a, a tool for permanent protection and conservation of the property that they own and, and live on and, and recreate on. So a conservation easement is really a prevention tool. It's, it's, a, it's a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and the land trust to protect uh, certain parts of the property for its conservation values. And it's something that is kind of a unique opportunity for a landowner to continue to own and use and live or recreate on the property, but to bind future owners with restrictions that protect those conservation values. I like to say when you own property, you own this bundle of rights that you have as, as the landowner. It's sort of like a bundle of sticks. And it's possible through a tool like a conservation easement to remove some of those sticks and convey them to somebody else. Um, you kind of think of like, like if you're a property owner, sometimes um, you think about like mineral rights is, are, are one of those sticks. Sometimes when you buy land, the mineral rights are, have already been removed from that bundle of rights that you own. You might not own the mineral rights. And similarly with a conservation easement, you can remove some of those rights and, and restrict future uses. The kinds of things, the kinds of rights or the kinds of sticks that we, that we generally talk about are the kinds of things that really would potentially have a negative impact on things like habitat value or water quality or scenic value. Um, so we look at things like where and how much you can develop the property, how much you can subdivide it, how much you can do with certain intensive uses on there that might have uh, an impact on things like habitat and water quality.
conservation easements are, are the, a really useful tool, but they're not, a, they don't do everything. It's a tool that doesn't necessarily um, do all of the protection that say fee title acquisition, actually buying the land and putting it into like a park or a nature area or something like that. It doesn't necessarily do all of the things for, for all of the people. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that your property taxes will go down if you enter into this. Um, it's not an allowance of, it doesn't create a situation where a landowner is required to have uh, access to the public. It doesn't, it doesn't create a new um, public access rule. Um, and it's also something that's that's not free. It takes, it takes a lot of resources to protect land this way um, and protection costs money. There are a number of reasons why a conservation easement would be useful. Um, they fill a very particular niche in this whole landscape of, of land protection opportunities or land management opportunities. But it really is important because most of the state of Minnesota is private land. Um, and, and there's a lot of public benefits that, that we get for habitat for wildlife, for example, or, or clean water that runs off of land that, that comes from land that somebody else owns. Um, it's also a tool that we can really tailor to make sure that the, the protection work that we're doing matches up with the landowner goals for the property. So we can, we can work with a landowner to say, this makes sense for us as a landowner. These are the things that we want to continue. These are the things that we want to restrict. And it's also very cost effective. It's a much more cost effective way than trying to buy all of the land um, that, that people want to think of for, for land that, that needs to be protected. There are an awful lot of legal structures that fit around or that constrain what you can do with conservation easements though. So it's a, it's a, it's a very regulated, very legal part of the, part of the whole real estate law um, uh, applies to conservation easements. So there's state laws and statutes that apply. There's federal laws that are really driven by the IRS tax code because Conservation easements can be a charitable gift. The value of that gift can be very significant and it's constrained by what the tax code says about how to, how to, how to develop that, the terms of that easement so that it can be considered to be a charitable contribution. Sometimes there are local laws that, that pertain. Um, the, there's a, this larger group called the Land Trust Alliance, which is a national group that helps develop um, standards for how to effectively do conservation easements. Um, and there's an accredi accreditation group. So we're an accredited land trust, which means that we have to follow certain standards and practices and we get audited for that, um, those practices on a regular basis. We also get a lot of grant funding through the state of Minnesota, um, mostly through the Outdoor Heritage Fund, part of the uh, Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment that was passed. So we have um, restrictions and, and things from the grant that, that uh, tell us how we have to do things. And then we also have a board of directors, like, like other nonprofits where we have a governing board of directors that makes all the decisions. So any land um, transaction that we do um, has to be approved by our, our board of directors. So landowners, as you might expect, are a pretty varied lot. Um, even though easements are just one tool, they can serve a kind of a variety of landowner needs depending on what the situation is for the individual landowners. And, and we, we take a lot of pride in the fact that the, the work that we do is very individually tailored, very negotiated with the landowner so that it makes sense for the landowner. And it makes sense for us in terms of achieving our conservation goals. In large part, um, the Ben, big benefit to landowners is that when they, they come to me and they say they, they want help protecting their land, it, it, it's driven by this, this desire to have a conservation legacy. They approach me and they say, I really want to make sure that when I'm gone, this land gets protected and cared for the way that I've protected it here. And they ask me if, if I can help them do that. And, and I'm very pleased when I can do that. And that's, that's kind of a big driver for most of the work that we do is the desire by the landowner to ensure that there's a conservation legacy. I mentioned before that in, in some cases, um, uh, the value of an easement can be donated and that's a really can be a really significant gift um, and, and can have a big impact on imp uh, your income taxes because of the, the value of a charitable donation. 
In other cases, we can, um, when we have funding from the state of Minnesota, do a direct payment to landowners for the value of the easement. And that can be a pretty significant benefit. And I'm working with one landowner who, who has property and they wanna see it be able to be owned by their kids in the future, um, but he's not sure about what the property taxes situation is gonna be. So what he wants to do is to get that payment for the value of the conservation easement put that into some sort of an investment endowment vehicle so that his kids have a stream of income that can pay those property taxes into the future so that it can stay in the family and can be managed for, for habitat and, and recreation into the future. So it helps with some of those generational transfers. Sometimes it can help with other sale um, of the property if, if you kind of think about how to, how to make it work. In some cases, not reliably, in some cases it can help reduce property taxes, but that's that's oftentimes a, a struggle to get it to the point where um, the the local tax uh, assessor will agree that there's some some value that needs to be uh, considered there. Establishing a conservation easement is a, is a real estate deal, um, and it's um, when you get to the point where you have a closing for a conservation easement, it feels a lot like buying and selling a house where you're at a title company signing a whole bunch of papers on, on things. But before we get to that point, we have a, a, a pretty thorough mechanism for, for taking an application. So we, we ask people to give us a, a fair bit of information about their property before we move forward on, on the, the project. We try to determine, does it fit with our, our funding opportunity? Do, do we have funding to do this project? Do we have the right sorts of property that that were that are high on our list? We get more applications than we have the capacity to deal with in terms of both um, staff capacity and and funding. So we have to be pretty selective to figure out how we're going to move forward and and get the best bang for the buck. We do a really deep dive into due diligence, so we look uh, a lot closer at title than your mortgage company did, um, because we expect that we're going to be engaged with this property. We're going to have this conservation easement forever, whereas a mortgage company might expect that they're going to be working with the with an owner for you know five to seven years before a land transaction happens. So we're going to be there forever. We want to make sure that we know um, a lot about the about the title, about legal access, about um, where this where the um, the boundaries of the property are. And then we get to the point where we work with very closely with the with the landowner to determine what the terms of the easement are. What's going to be restricted? What are the rights that are going to be retained? And that can be um, a, a pretty um, challenging process to work with the landowner because you have to think about uh, out into the future. Because when we put a conservation easement in place, the 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 restrictions are permanent, so it gets recorded with the property, and that restriction. Uh, binds all future owners of the property. So it's not something that um, is taken lightly. As I mentioned, we do the closing a lot like a closing on, on other real estate deals. And then we have, with the, with the conservation easement, there is an ongoing relationship between the landowner and the, the land trust that holds the easement. So it's unlike like buying and selling a car, where you sell a car, you're never gonna see that, that um, buyer again. We have this ongoing relationship with the, with the um, landowner in, in perpetuity. So what are the practical implications when we say that relationship is in perpetuity? We have an annual monitoring program. We do interpretations, we do enforcement. We do, we do work after closing that continues on um, with responsibilities that are held by both the easement holder, the land trust and, and the owner of the property. So, we monitor every conservation easement that we have every year. So either a, a, a staff person or a volunteer will be contacting the, the, the owner of that, that land, setting up a time to talk, setting up a time to visit the property and, and visiting and, and you know, gathering information and making sure that um, everything is um, as it should be. We also respond when, when a landowner says, you know, I'm not sure if I can do this. What is this allowed with my easement? Is it not? So we respond to a lot of uh, requests for interpretation. And then in the event of violations, we have to enforce the easement. So in some cases that has led to um, legal action and, and taking people to court um, when they violated the, the terms of the easement. So it's not something that um, we just say, well, that was a mistake, um, let's move on. It's, we have to get that corrected. The landowner um, continues to own and manage the land um, 
that the easement is on. It has to be consistent with the with the terms of the easement, um, but they continue to own and manage the land uh, and and use it oftentimes for the same purpose that they've they've been doing um, prior to the easement. But there may be things that they're they want to do that they can't do because they've have um, sold or given away those the the right to do that. You continue to pay property taxes. Um, and you just you you have to allow us to be able to uh, to monitor the easement, but we also ask people to to let us know if things are coming up. It's like I'm planning to sell the land, or I'm going to give it to my kids, or or something is going on. We ask you to to um, give us some some notice about things. But what we're we're, we're really doing, we're, we really rely on on visionary landowners that want to ensure permanent protection of their their land for the purposes of protecting it for habitat, protecting it for wildlife and water quality, and protecting it for the future. And what we do at our most basic level is to really help people to protect nature now and forever. And with that, I'm just going to say. Thank you for your attention. And I have some time for questions, I think. So um, thank you. Yeah. More significant properties in Cook County. Well, we have a conservation easement on much of the Grand Marais Harbor. Um, that's that's a pretty significant one that that keeps it for, you know has restrictions about what can be done there. Um, we just did a project uh, up on the Flute Reed River, protecting nearly 200 acres of of land um, on the Flute Reed, uh, making sure that that continues to be cold and clear as as clear as we can we can make it. Um, we have a number of other smaller properties that are on on Lake Superior shoreline. Um, that are really protecting that that um, Lake Superior shore, which is um, unique and rare and really important. So, kind of a, kind of a range of things there. Was there any in particular that you were? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, I have uh, brochures and I have some contact information. We have a I have a booth out in the uh, in the gym, so we can uh, if you want to catch me just after this, we can um, go out there and I can give you some additional information. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah. Have you what have you done with the um, Sugarloaf Cove is a scientific and natural area, and it's which is part of the Department of Natural Resources, not not the Minnesota Land Trust. I personally have a long history at Sugarloaf Cove, which which um, so I, I was involved in in the wetland restoration that happened there uh, back in the late '90s. So that that bottom part where the where the buildings used to be and where it used to be filled in for the for the road. Um, hired a bunch of people with excavators to dig some of that stuff out. Ah, okay. Yeah, good. So the, so I'm, I'm hoping that the exposures are still up and keeping some of the deer out from eating all the cedar trees there. Yeah, that's a, that's a different program though. So we, we work pretty closely with, with DNR in a lot of cases. We work really closely with some of the other um, groups like Sugarloaf that are, that are helping with um, the the work that they're doing to help with educate people about restoring the coastal forest. Um, so um, I just dropped off a bunch of of our brochures with uh, with Molly at, at Sugarloaf to help with um, some landowners that that want to participate in that program to help restore the coastal forest um, might be interested in doing a conservation easement as well. So hopefully there's some coordination there that leads to to, to more projects for us. <laughs> yeah yeah that's a really good question the 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 priority the driver that that we have right now for um cook county as well as all all of the lakes Superior shoreline in minnesota is is focusing on uh cold water streams 
trying to ensure that the land management is done in a way that maintains the cold water uh, resource, both in Lake Superior and the, and the cold water streams. So in order to have cold water in the streams, you need good forest um, plant communities on the land because all of that water is coming, coming off, the, off the land. So we're looking largely at um, watersheds of um, cold water streams, designated trout streams for the most part. Um, so that's sort of if you're if you're thinking about what what our highest priority um, areas for activity are are these in in these watersheds of of trout streams so that we can not just maintain the habitat of the forest but maintain the habitat of the stream that's feeding into Lake Superior and maintaining the quality of Lake Superior as well. Yes. Yeah, sometimes, um, and that is largely, I mean, we try to do properties that are 40 acres or bigger in size, because it, it takes just as much work to do a, a, a two acre property as it does a 40 acre property or a hundred acre property. Um, and we want to try to get the most bang for the buck. Um, so size is a, is a big thing that, you know, people say, well, I've got, I've got two acres of really beautiful land and I've got a cabin and I've got a garage and pretty soon there's not a lot of area left to protect. So that may be one reason is that it might be might be too small. We look at we look at size, we look at the ecological quality of the property. So if it is in really high quality or there's rare species or something something unique and, and important about it that that's different than the surrounding landscape, then we might we might look at it um, might rank more highly. Context is another one. If you're if you've got a small parcel that's surrounded by a lot of development, the, the benefit, the conservation gain that we get there might not be as much as if you've got a similar size parcel that's connected to something else or creates a corridor. Or um, So we, we look at trying to build complexes of protected property to, to really um, leverage the, the conservation benefits from, from adjacent property. So we, we rank things, like I said, we, we rank it on, on size, quality, context, um, readiness of the landowner, sometimes um, somebody will approach us and they say, well, this is owned by, by a, a family trust and I really want to do this, but my siblings don't. Um, it's like, well, you, you kind of have to have all of those things in order before you, we can act and help you with anything. Um, those are kinds of the things that we, that we use for ranking. And then sometimes we just don't have the money to do it. Um, it, might be, it might be a good property. It might be something that we want to do. Um, but we might not have the either the the staff capacity or the funding to be able to do now. So we might say, it's it, it looks like a, a beautiful piece of property, but we might have to wait. Um, Right. There's there's a pretty big gamut, yeah. Um, but the the bottom line is that we want people to be able to to occupy the property and to be able to care for it. So that usually means that we have in, in most of our easements, part of the property is, is where there's an allowance for development, whether that's um, you know, a cabin or a, you know, a, a permanent full-time residence and part of the property is, is protected. So you can't build on part of it. So we try to constrain where and how much development happens on the property, but we want people to, to own it and manage it and care for it. We just want to make sure that that forever into the future, it doesn't get subdivided. You don't see more and more houses and cabins um, built across it and subdivided into smaller and smaller parcels, which leads to more roads and trails and stream crossings and all of those other things that tend to impact, you know, fragment habitat and, and have impacts on water quality. Yeah. You have another question? All right, let's go for it. <laughs> the, 
the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment um, pretty much allowed us to more than double our effort. Um, we get we get really significant funding through grants that that's all provided by the by that by that law, um, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to pay for all of the administrative work that we have to do to to establish a conservation easement. Um, which can be pretty substantial. It could be fifty, sixty thousand dollars to actually pay for the the value or, or to to pay for all of the things that we have to do to get to that closing and to be able to monitor and maintain that easement in the future. So it allows us to pay for all of that administrative work and the staff work. It also allows us to pay landowners for some or all of the value of the conservation easement. So for for a lot of landowners, what we'll end up doing is that we'll do um, we'll get pretty far down the road, and we'll say here's here's the restrictions that we're going to play place on the property. You know, no subdivision. It's got to be development's got to be here. Uh, whatever whatever restrictions we have, and we'll hire an appraiser that's qualified to do conservation easements, and say we'll we'll hand them basically the the draft of the conservation easement, and say if you put this property on the market without any restrictions on it, um, what would it sell for? And what's the market value of it today, unencumbered by the easement? What's the what's the value of it after the easement is put in place? And usually there's a significant reduction in market value. So say say the value of that property is reduced by 40%. That 40%, we we can, if we have the grant funding through the through this legacy amendment funding, we can pay the landowner for that. And that can be a lot of money, especially when you're talking about. Lake Superior shoreline or or um, other shoreline, so it it's made a huge difference for us. Do you have to get approval from the legislature for this piece of land? If they do, or do they give you a money and then you your team? Um, it's a little it's a it's a little bit more restrictive than than um, than that. What we we have to provide an application or a grant program. Um, design that says what are our goals what types of property we're going to be going after how much we're going to be doing um and then we we get approval from dnr before we spend money on uh each of the parcels because the money goes through dnr so the legis the way it works is that the um the tax money gets collected it goes to a big pot of money called the in this case the outdoor heritage fund which is one piece of the the clean water land and legacy amendment the there's a group called the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council that reviews all of the grant applications that come in. They have to approve it and recommend that to go to get funded. We go from recommendation from the council to the legislature. The legislature approves it and sends money to DNR. DNR writes the grant to us, and then we have the money. Or then we spend the money and we get reimbursed for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so to get back to the, the, the thrust of the question is that we don't have to get approval for each individual property at the outset, but it does get reviewed by, by DNR, uh, at some point acting on behalf of the, for the state of Minnesota. Um, so the legislature doesn't approve each parcel, but it gets, it gets pretty thorough, thoroughly vetted, um, it would it would be nearly impossible to 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 work if we had to do a parcel by parcel approval at the legislature. <laughs> yeah, and and forgive me if the, I'm getting too detailed on the on the answers here, but that's that's a it's a complicated answer to a question. Yeah, thank you.